Good morning and welcome to the ARC Michigan Disability Policy Webinar Series. I have a few items to go over before we get started. If you look in the upper right hand corner of your screen, you should see an orange arrow and that's your go to webinar control panel. If you've joined via the app on your phone, the control panel is on a pull down menu at the top or bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with your audio today, you're going to want to go into the control panel and open up the audio tab and do a mic and speaker sound check. Participants are muted for this presentation, but questions and comments can be typed into the GoToWebinar window within the control panel. A link to the handouts is available within the control panel under the handouts tab, and also that's available at ARC, on the ARC Michigan website arcmi.org. If you lose your GoToWebinar screen at any point, you're going to want to look for the blue flower icon in your taskbar to bring it back up. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sherry Boyd, and I'm the director at the ARC Michigan. I want to thank you for joining us for our fourth and final webinar Friday morning public policy seminar series. Um, today we have Nicole Jorwick from the ARC um, US. She's a S Senior Director of Public Policy there. ARC is um, our affiliate national organization and their focus is on um, advocating for and serving people with developmental and intellectual developmental disabilities and their families. Prior to joining the ARC policy team, Nicole served as Senior Policy Advisor for the state of Illinois. Prior to that appointment, Nicole served as the president of the Institute on Public Policy for People with Disabilities. She's an accomplished special education attorney and an advocate for students with disabilities with a focus on transition aged youth. She received her JD and Child and Family Law Certificate from Loyola University, Chicago. She received her bachelor's from University of Illinois. Nicole is also a sibling to her brother, Chris, who is 31 and has autism. Thank you, Nicole. We're happy to have you today. Thanks so much, Sherry. Glad to be glad to be with everyone um, in Mich at the Arc of Michigan on a Friday morning. Um, I am uh, glad to be with you virtually, and it's a really exciting and big week. So I've got a lot of really new and hot off the presses information to share about a lot of priority issues for the ARC and um, for the disability community as a whole and also for the for a much broader community. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, Sherry already mentioned my brother Chris is, who is the person who's next to me in the photo that I'm in. Um, and while Chris is an important part of why I became so passionate of, about working, um, advocating um, with people with disabilities, it actually was before Chris was even born when inclusion and integration was so important in my life. And that's depicted by the other photo, which is my friend, Sam, um, who we were in the first uh, included classroom in our school district a long time ago. Um, and I, I, so I've been really lucky that disability has been part of the fabric of my life and also has, uh, and that's painted the work that we're doing to make sure that community integration is an option for everyone. Um, and so we can go to the next slide. Obviously, um, I, since last year, <laughs> um, everything COVID-19 took all the attention, whether it was through regulatory work um, or through trying to push Congress to get some dedicated funding to support people with disabilities. Uh, that was really what we were pushing for. And so we can go to the next slide. Uh, it's hard to believe that it's been 15 months now, uh, a little over 15 months. We knew from the very beginning that people with disabilities uh, and people who are immunocompromised are going to be at particular risk, face um, high risk of complications and needing to isolate themselves for protection, and that there would be difficulties with that. Uh, and so from the very beginning, the ARC, while we worked on a lot of different fronts, we worked on housing, we worked on education, on, on general health care, we really were clear to stick with some uh, set priorities in order to be clear with Congress and also with our grassroots about what we were pushing for. And we can go to the next slide. 
Our priority issues throughout the pandemic uh, were dedicated funding for Medicaid home and community-based services. We knew um, because of some of the uh, intricacies of the Medicaid program that I will go through a little bit later just because I can't be in front of a, a webcam or in front of a podium without doing a little Medicaid 101. But because of the fundamental flaws in the Medicaid program, we knew that there needed to be some dedicated funding for Medicaid home and community-based services or HCBS, those services that people with disabilities rely on in order to stay in their homes and communities, which is obviously the alternative of uh, institutional placements, including nursing facilities and institutions and states that still have them. Uh, we also focused a lot on personal protective equipment for direct support professionals and just generally more support for the direct care workforce. Um, and that's because while eventually some states started to do it themselves and recognize uh, DSPs and the direct care workforce generally, including home health workers, uh, uh, personal care attendants, et cetera, um, the, as essential workers, that was not something that was done at the federal level. And so that, therefore, they, those workforces weren't getting the same protections as a lot of other um, more traditional medical uh, work parts of the workforce were getting. And so that was something that was a, a major priority as well as paid leave for family caregivers, uh, including the wide uh, definition, broad definition of what family caregivers means, including people like me, a sibling or a grandparent who might be caring for a loved one with a disability, a grandchild with a disability, and making sure that there were no limitations on the economic impact payments or the stimulus payments that came through the different bills. And so we really had a clear set of issues. Unfortunately, it took us a while to get there, but we did get a lot of that done. And we can go to the next slide. Um, and so those were our, our, our priority issues for the remainder of the 116th Congress. A new Congress came in um, in uh, January. But before the end of the year, uh, I should I would be remiss not to mention that we did get a couple of positive things. Uh, there were additional stimulus payments uh, at the end of the year, and the and people with who were declared dependents were eligible for those. So that was a small victory. In addition, um, we got a three-year reauthorization of the Money Follows the Person program. If you you've seen me speak, you've heard me talk about the Money Follows the Person program, but for a brief refresher, it is a program that provides 100% of funding, 100% of a federal matching assistance percentage, which is the federal share of, Met of Medicaid services for one year to transition people out of institutional settings and nursing facilities and into the community. So a three-year reauthorization was a positive, um, but it was not the same uh, dedicated funding for the broad system that we had been pushing for. And so when the 117th Congress uh, started out, uh, we continued to push those same priorities because again, the majority of them had not been addressed. There had been some paid leave provisions, but they weren't inclusive of all family members. Um, there had been some stimulus payments, but again, they weren't all available to everyone. And so uh, then we turned to, and we can go to the next slide, the American Rescue Plan. Um, in January, President Biden released uh, his version of the American Rescue Plan, which was um, a, stimulus, an, a stimulus bill proposed by the Biden administration. And at that time, uh, we were worried because they actually didn't include dedicated funding for Medicaid and HCBS in what the administration put out. And so we had to turn to Congress to continue to push on the issue. Um, and uh, we actually ended up getting a lot into the bill, and I think it's on the next slide, so I'll, I'll turn to that. It's, yes, okay, good. <laughs> uh, always good when I remember my own slide deck. Um, so the American Rescue Plan did pass in March of this year. March, you're gonna see, you're gonna hear um, throughout this presentation was a pretty big month, um, although June's turning out pretty big too. Um, so March 11th of 2021, the rescue plan passed, or that is, so it's called ARPA, or that's what we call it, the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, and that included finally that what, what we and um, what we've been pushing for, which was a 10%, so a 10% additional FMAP, so that federal matching assistance percentage 
so if a state gets a match of um, of 60, then that's going to go up to 70 for one year for dedicated to Medicaid home and community-based services. That total of $12.7 billion investment in um, to Medicaid HCBS. It was very desperately needed. And as I said, it's funding that we had been pushing for for a year. So while it was very exciting, I've really been equating that funding to um, patching holes in a sinking ship. Uh, because of how much stress and strain the system has been under, how many programs have been closed, workers have been lost. And so it's really great, but it's why we're going to keep pushing for other things. Uh, the direct support professional and the direct care workforce uh, was uh, deemed as essential for a lot of the um, a lot of the protections that were included in the rescue plan. Stimulus checks did include adult dependents. So there was no uh, discrimination if somebody was declared a dependent on their fam parents or other family members' taxes. There was additional funding for um, SNAP, uh, for, for food assistance, for housing, continuation of the eviction moratorium, continuation and expansion of the paid leave tax credits that had come through previous COVID bills, um, and improvements to the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit that benefit a lot of families. So the um, American Rescue Plan Act, let's see if I can remember, it's been a while, but I believe it was $1.9 uh, trillion that passed in March. And so then we can go to the next slide. Um, and, oh, next slide again, sorry. <laughs> I guess I had that in there twice. And so that was March. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about something else that happened in March, which was the int uh, introduction of a discussion draft of a really important bill, but I'm gonna save that for a little while later because I don't want it to get mixed up with everything else. So the rescue plan was stimulus funding and then the administration started to talk about recovery and economic recovery, recovery from the pandemic. And on March 31st, uh, President Biden announced his infrastructure package, um, a $3 trillion package called the American Jobs Plan. And within that plan, actually the largest part of that plan, was a $400 billion investment in Medicaid home and community-based services to both expand access to those Medicaid home and community-based services and address um, work, workforce wages and workforce supports for the direct care workforce, create more and better direct care jobs. Uh, there, wasn't, there were not a lot of details included in the American Jobs Plan aside from that huge historic in, investment, which is major, one of the only policies that was specifically called out was around um, permanent reauthorization of the Money Follows the Person program that I described earlier. Um, that's been something that the ARC has been pushing for for years um, that I personally have been lobbying on for five, six years. So we're really happy to see that that's going to be part of um, whatever, we, whatever will be coming together. Um, something that I should take a step back and note on the American Rescue Plan Act um, is that that passed through a, a, a um, process called budget reconciliation. That might sound familiar because, well, if you watch the news, it's sounding probably familiar to a lot of folks, but from a historical context in 2017, the bills that we were fighting up, fighting against that had those large cuts to Medicaid um, were also going through that process. The main um, draw to that process is that it only requires a simple majority, so 51 senators to pass a bill versus the 60. Um, and so that um, Vice President Harris cast, cast the deciding vote on the American Rescue Plan uh, Act in March, and it's expected that whatever comes together in the fall, which I'll get into in a little while, will also go through that same process. Um, and so we had the $400 billion investment. One thing I, I want to note about this that has been really interesting is that the $400 billion investment for Medicaid home and community-based services is actually polling better than any other part of the infrastructure bill uh, in 10 key states, and that's bipartisan. It's uh, There is a group called Data for Progress that did some uh, polling. And so I, it's been really interesting. And I frankly think that's why we're seeing a lot of continued support because it is polling so well with the general public. We also saw um, another huge package. So the, the American Jobs Plan was $3 trillion. 
And then we saw a $2 trillion package called the American Family Plan. Uh, it includes a $225 billion investment in paid leave and a $225 billion investment in childcare, as well as continued expansion of the earned income tax credit and child tax credit through 2025. And those are tax credits that benefit a lot of families, as I mentioned before, and also a lot of the direct care workforce. Um, so those are two huge packages. Um, now, and we can go to the next slide, I think. Um, yeah, so uh, right now there continues to be a lot of momentum and focus on HCBS. I talked about polling. Um, you had, for example, um, the head of the Domestic Policy Council in the White House, Ambassador Susan Wright Rice, um, tweet out about the $400 billion on Tuesday, which was the anniversary of the Olmstead Supreme Court decision that says that people with, a dis with disabilities have the right to live in the community. There's this high level administrative support on this funding that's really unprecedented. Um, it is part of the American Jobs Plan. It's not part of um, the bipartisan infrastructure package that you might have heard just came together yesterday. Um, it's really unfortunate that this funding isn't seen as infrastructure because as we've been saying, people are infrastructure, care is infrastructure. Um, but the bipartisan group of senators who were working on that package that turned into a $1.2 trillion package uh, were really focused on traditional infrastructure, roads, bridges. And so what that means is that we're gonna have to be pushing to include the $400 billion investment uh, into whatever is moving in the reconciliation package. What the political dynamics that are going on right now in Washington, D.C. is that President Biden and the leader, um, Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer are saying that there's not going to be a vote on the bipartisan infrastructure package until there's a vote on this broader reconciliation package that we hope and be pushing for to include the HCBS funding um, paid leave and a, a variety of other issues. And so uh, we can go to the next slide. And that turns into very exciting news that just happened yesterday. Um, and that's why there's not a lot on the slide because I was paranoid to put too much in because I turned this in well before, well, a few days before the bill was coming out. And that is the, the actual bill. So I talked about President Biden put the $400 billion in the American Jobs Plan but Congress has now released a bill that would operationalize that policy. And that is the Better Care, Better Jobs Act. It was introduced yesterday um, on the Senate side. It had 40 senators um, right off the bat, which is huge. And we got them all in two days, which is also huge. Um, and both of your senators are on there, um, Senators uh, Peter and Stabenow. Uh, we're, and most importantly for Michigan at least, uh, it was led on the House side by Representative uh, Debbie Dingell. And this bill would provide, it's gonna be the vehicle to house the $400 billion. It's going to include permanent money follows a person um, extension. It's going to include um, um, $100 billion in planning grants for states. We know, so the American Rescue Plan Act included that $12.7 billion. It didn't have a lot of um, guidance or um, ways that the states could use the funding, and that's because it got stripped out, but that's a whole um, behind the scenes story that nobody needs. But, uh, and so they had to wait for CMS to come up with guidance, and now it's taking states a little bit longer to plan to use that money. And that was $12.7 billion. So obviously it's gonna require a great deal of planning, looking at systems and what needs to change in order to build the infrastructure and capacity to serve people, everybody who needs these services. Um, but focus on, and then there will also be additional FMAPs. So there's that planning funding, and then there are will also be additional FMAPs um, or that federal matching assistance percentages and bumps to the federal funding to support um, moving people off of waiting lists, expanding services to new populations, because not every state has, has waiting lists, um, and also a great deal of support to rate, looking at rates, looking at wages for the workforce, looking at training for the workforce. So there's a great deal um, in there that's that's really positive. So that bill, as I said, just just was released yesterday. Um, the ARC, anyone who I would assume assume there's a lot of um, 
chapter folks on here, you all should have received an email from me. We pushed out a lot of information, sample letters to the editor. So we really encourage everyone to be to be pushing out more about this bill because we do need to get at least um, all of the Democrats on board, but we'll always be trying to get at least some Republicans uh, because this is an issue. Actually, the, the head of the Senate Finance Committee, the Republican head of the Senate Finance Committee, Senator Crapo for Idaho during the budget, um, Senate Finance Committee budget hearing. And the president, it's important to note that another sign, not only Ambassador Rice's tweet, but also another sign of the administrative commitment to this $400 billion was that it was included in President Biden's budget. Um, and so in that hearing, a Rep Republican Senator Crapo brought up this $400 million and says, said that there was a lot of bipartisan support. So we'll be pushing for that. Um, I'm gonna pause here because I know I just dropped a lot of information. So if there are questions about um, the American Rescue Plan or about um, uh, the Better Care, Better Jobs Act or anything I've said, please feel free to type them into um, the chat and I'll, I can take them now. Nicole, we don't have any questions just yet. Okay. Um, I should have said at the beginning, please feel free to do so anytime during the presentation. I'm just going to take a sip of water so my voice gets less froggy. Okay, great. That'll give people a second to finish typing in their questions. I will just assume that I've explained everything so well so far <laughs> and that it's a little early in the morning, but please feel free to, to ask questions because I know I'm, I'm dropping a lot of information. Right. Um, we have a question about the Better Care, Better Jobs Act. Mm -hmm. Does that dovetail at all with the HCBS Access Act that Representative Dingle is working on? Um, so great question, and I am going to talk about the HCBS Access Act, um, and I was I was going to kind of cover this when I got there, but I can do it here, no problem. Um, for folks that don't know about the HCBS Access Act, Access Act you're going to learn more about it in a little bit. But the HCBS Access Act would um, eliminate waiting lists completely by making home and community-based services an entitlement under the Medicaid program. Um, unfortunately, that is not part of these conversations because it it costs too much. Um, because this funding needs to address both access to services and worker issues, it just wasn't going to be a plausible thing. And there's not really a way that you can piece that, um, separate HAA apart because it's fundamentally about expanding services to at least 830,000 people, which is going to have a huge cost attached to it. And th that's the number of people on the waiting list across the country. And so the way that I've been describing it and the way that everybody should think about it, first of all, it means that there's going to be more advocacy that we're going to need after this all comes together, um, which is fine because obviously we have a wonderful network of advocates, but that the $12.7 billion in the American Rescue Plan Act um, that was, as I already said, kind of patches to patches to holes in a sinking ship. This $400 billion is um, in the Better Care, Better Jobs Act is going to build a lot of capacity, build a lot of infrastructure, allow states to plan and take a look at their systems holistically and make some really needed changes. That is going to the, be the bridge, pun intended, to get to the HCBS Access Act. It's also going to make it a lot cheaper to get there. Um, because by then you'll have pulled a lot of people off of the waiting list and you'll also have built that infrastructure. And so um, it's not part of it, but it is part of the thought process, if that makes sense. And it is helpful that in all of these bills, you have the same offices working together. Um, and so we we will turn back to the HCBS Access Act and I'll, I'll talk about it later as well, but that's not going to come until we... Um, get through the Better Care, Better Jobs Act and get through the reconciliation process. Um, and yeah, but it will it will be helpful, but we're not gonna be able to include it in this bill. All right, we have a couple questions about money follows the person. Okay. Um, can you briefly explain what you mean by that phrase? Sure, so money, I'm glad you asked because it is confusing. It sounds like money should follow the person, meaning that individual somehow retain that funding individually themselves. That's not what it actually means. Money follows the person means that the funding that somebody that is supporting someone in, in an institution, which is 
always more expensive than living in the community, um, follows that individual into the community, meaning that they get the level of support that they need in the community because it's probably going to cost more than a typical um, service system in the, or a typical beneficiary in the community. And so it's about making sure that um, that's why that 100% of federal funding is so important for the first year because often that that transition is what keeps people in institutions even if they want to leave because that um, that can be where the costs are and states don't have that investment to make on the front end. And so that funding from the federal government makes it easier. So it's not that there's like a budget that follows the person. It's just that any supports that that individual needs um, goes with them. And what's really positive about the program is that it does show cost savings. So even though the money does go with them, community-based supports per beneficiary per month is lower at tw by 22%. And most importantly, quality of life and outcome measures are better for everybody who's in the program. All right, thank you for that. I think you're, that answered several of the questions in one answer. But <laughs> if it didn't, please type in all your follow-up questions in the chat and I'll relay them to Nicole at our next break. Okay, thank you. And then we can go to the next slide. Um, and so I've been talking about everything in this bucket. And so it, this bucket of what we're pushing for and what we're pushing for the timing, um, at least right now, this hour, this minute, because I will say that it changes, um, is that we anticipate, so through because of the budget reconciliation process, um, the House and the Senate each have to vote on something called the budget res resolution, which is, you know, the problem that they're trying to solve pretty, for lack of a better analogy. So the one for the American Rescue Plan was all around COVID. Um, this one will look a little bit different. It's expected that that's going to be um, voted on and uh, voted on before 4th of July. No, that's impossible before August recess, sorry. That was an old an old timeline. Before um, the August recess, and then um, once they're back in September, uh, that's when they will be voting on the actual contents of the bill. So the Better Care, Better Jobs Act, I'm assuming, I'm sure it will um, get in, uh, that will happen. The goal is to get that all done by September 30th, uh, which is the end of the fiscal year. And so that's kind of the timeline to be looking at for what, what our current priorities are. Uh, I should have included these in there. It might be actually at, at the end of my presentation, but uh, our priorities, just, just like we had a set of core priorities during the last year, we did the same thing this year. Again, that doesn't mean that we weren't aren't also working on a lot, a lot of other fronts, but our top three priorities are this $400 billion, to address both access to HCBS as well as workforce issues, um, a, paid, a national paid leave program, and um, fixes to the social SSI income and asset limits. And that is a newer piece into our recovery priority, and that's because of my colleague Bethany, um, who is, is really great, but is also really pushing the administration to say, if you're gonna look at economic recovery, you have to look at fixing some of these decades old income and asset limits, which really um, tie the hands of individuals with disabilities who wanna work and work more. Um, once we get through September 30th, there's obviously a lot of other things that we're gonna need to continue to work on. Um, we will turn back to the HCBS Access Act. That is gonna, going to continue to be our long-term goal. Uh, because that's how we fundamentally, this is all huge and historic, but we still need to fundamentally change the system. And I'm going to talk more about what that means in a moment. We're focusing on continuing to, housing is a real, was a really big priority in the president's infrastructure package, so we'll look to see how that's included in the reconciliation package. We're always keeping our eyes out on the um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It's overdue for a reauthorization. Now wouldn't be the right time, but you never know. Uh, healthcare, the, so the Supreme Court, for folks who might not have saw, um, seen, upheld the Affordable Care Act last week, which was 
um, really great because if they would have repealed it, we would have had to go into a fire dr drill on healthcare reform legislation while we're also doing all this other stuff. But healthcare reform is really important to mention because that could be an area where, for example, we could get HAA included. Um, and so there's we're, uh, there's always going to be things that are out there that we're continuing to work on even beyond this reconciliation package because they need to do a lot of fixes with healthcare. We're also working on things outside of Medicaid because Medicaid, as I'm going to talk about, has some limitations, including in uh, very strict income and asset limits. And because of that, we really need to take a look at what we can do to support people who might not be eligible for Medicaid um, while, um, while strengthening the Medicaid program as well. Um, people might not remember, but the Affordable Care Act, when it passed in um, 2009 or 2010, did include um, a long-term care component called the CLASS Act. It would have been a cash benefit to people who weren't eligible for um, Medicaid, but still had some long-term care needs, uh, but it was later repealed. And so we're, we're working with folks, including the original drafters of that legislation to see what else we can do. So really working on, on all fronts to see what we can do to support the need, the long-term service and support system, because uh, when it comes to that system, Medicaid is really the only game in town. And that's why I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that program and why we're Focus so much on it, whether luckily we're moving past the protecting phase and into the fixing phase. And so we can go to the next slide. We can go to the next slide. Um, what exactly is Medicaid? Um, Medicaid, as I, as I always say, is complicated. Um, we have been so focused on protecting Medicaid uh, during 2017 uh, that when the big cuts up to a trillion dollars over 10 years to Medicaid were um, being contemplated, We've been in defense mode ever since then. And in all of those conversations, we, when I was on the Hill um, during 2017 over hundreds of meetings, they would talk about problems with the program and we would say, well, yes, of course, there's things we wanna fix about the program, but you can't fix something with, and then cut the funding. It just doesn't work that way. And luckily we are out of that phase now. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Medicaid is really important and it's also, it is complex because it is a program that is run by the states that is overseen by a federal a federal law. Um, so it's this real, it's a state and federal partnership um, and it's a program that, but it's a program that varies across the states because it is state run. It varies in what it's called. It varies in who they, who is served. It varies in the types of services offered. But one in five people rely on Medicaid, um, almost 75 million people as of last June, and over 11 million people with disabilities rely on it, not only for healthcare, it's so much more than a healthcare program, but also for those long-term services and supports to support them to live independently in their community. The long-term services and supports, so Medicaid has the healthcare side and then the long-term services and support side. LTSS or long-term services and supports is the umbrella term that includes um, both the institutional side of Medicaid. So um, nursing facilities, I, uh, ICFs in my home state of Illinois, for example, they still have seven institutions open shamefully. Um, and so that would all be covered under, the, under LTSS, but not as HCBS. So LTSS includes the institutional side and home and community-based services or HCBS. Um, why we have to remain so vigilant around this program is that while people with disabilities and older adults make up um, only about 20 to 25 percent of the beneficiaries of the program, uh, they account for about 48 percent of the costs. And that is because of the high cost and the long-term nature of the need of um, long-term services and supports. Uh, so that's why the ARC and all the disability community needs to be really engaged on Medicaid broadly. You can go to the next slide. So what are home and community-based services? Um, it's what chapters of the ARC that provide services. So I, I know that that doesn't happen in every state, but in a lot of states, um, we have service provider chapters, uh, any disability service provider that's providing things like um, day programming, job coaching, a lot of Medicaid, a lot of employment services are funded through Medicaid. Um, 
supports in, in a re, in a residential setting, assistance with personal hygiene, all of that, all of those are home and community based services. You can go to the next slide. As I mentioned, this is a state and federal partnership, but it's overseen by the federal law. So the federal government sets a basic set of rules, basic set of eligibility. It's a floor, um, but states can go on above and beyond it, and many do. Um, and but the federal government also creates what are, or decides what are mandatory services and what are optional services. Um, and so mandatory services under the federal law, and again, this was a law that was written in 1965, um, are traditional healthcare services, going to the doctor, going to the emergency room, that sort of thing, prescription drugs, uh, nursing home services, nursing facilities, as well as institutional services. Um, and unfortunately, what are optional home and community-based services? What does that mean? Well, when a service services are optional, that means that states are allowed to cap those services, which is why there can be waiting lists. That's the biggest representation of what it means that home and community-based services are optional. In a state, in my in a state like my home state of Illinois, any of the 20,000 people that are on the waiting list there would be able to go to um, one of those seven institutions and have an entitlement to a placement there, but would rather wait for sometimes up to a decade to get services instead of doing that, which is part of why we needed to flip that, what we call institutional bias. Uh, the fact that institutional services are mandatory while, while home and community-based services are optional is what, what, what I'm referring to when I'm talking about the institutional bias in Medicaid. That institutional bias, proved particularly um, tragic during um, the COVID pandemic. We know that um, a third of the deaths occurred in long-term care facilities, including nursing facilities and other institutions, and highlighting the, the public health risk of these large congregate settings. And so that means that we need to continue to build the alternative. And as it's really depicted here very clearly on the slide, the alternative to those nursing facilities are home and community-based services which is why we need that $400 billion investment and then some. We can go to the next slide. So um, I am not the social security expert, so I want to say that from the very beginning, but um, when people, but I do have, we do have some updates. And so Bethany gave me some slides to throw in here about um, some things. But actually, before I jump into that, I should open it up and ask. I just talked a lot about the structure of Medicaid. Does anyone have any questions about that? We do have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, first one, knowing how HCBS was initially rolled out, um, will there likely be a state plan and a gradual rollout? Um, I have questions how wait lists can eliminate, be eliminated overnight within uh, the current provider crisis. Sure. Um, so they can't be eliminated overnight, and neither the um, Better Care, Better Jobs Act or the HCBS Access, Access Act contemplate that. They both have very long planning periods for states to do it for the capacity building, because you're absolutely right. We cannot, we could not put 830,000 more people into the system that we have now. It's not even appropriately serving individuals in it. So we're with you, and that's definitely. Um, that's definitely part of the conversation that we're having. Um, and remind me of the first part of the question. Sorry, Courtney. Oh. I'm sorry. Um, it, well, do we can we expect the HCBS to be rolled out um, uh, with a statewide plan? And how long do you think that will take? Got it. So. Um, the Better Care, Better Jobs Act includes, um, it, right now it's one year, frankly, where it's likely to, to get um, expanded past a year because it's a that's not a lot of time for the states to do a lot of planning. And so they will have to create a plan. It will not happen overnight. Um, and that's what the, the Better Care, Better Jobs Act has $100 billion going to the states to pay for that plan and to pay for the things that need to go into, you know, like, everything from you know technological fixes. And I'm sure that, I don't know how Michigan is, but I can say that in Illinois, the systems were very antiquated. Um, and so there's a lot of funding that will help with some of those things, also help with doing some initial bumps to rates and things like that. 
in order to start to build the capacity. So definitely will not all happen at once. There will be planning and most importantly, there's requirements for stakeholder input at every step of the process. So it'll be really important for state level advocates to be engaging. Our other question, um, with the passing of the HCBS final rule and Medicaid funds no longer used for non HCBS settings, will money follow the person ever be able to be used for those who qualify for institutional care but have always lived in a community setting? So Medicaid funding can still be spent on non um, HCBS services. It just can't be spent. HCBS dollars can't be spent. That's what the HCBS settings rule um, says. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that point. Um, we're not at the point yet where Medicaid dollars can't be spent on institutional care. Um, I think what you might be referring to is that there are some advocates that push for um, being able to use money, uh, money follows the person funding to transition people, for example, out of maybe a group home and into um, into um, individual, in it, their individual home or something like that. And so that would be moving someone from an, technically an HCBS setting to another HCBS setting. At this point, that is not contemplated, um, but that does not mean that a state couldn't put something like that into their plan for building capacity, for example, but that's not gonna come through the permanent reauthorization of HCBS, or sorry, of um, Money Follows a Person. Thank you for that explanation, Nicole. No further questions right now. Okay, um, and if you have too many questions on social security, I might need to phone a friend, but um, when people talk about um, social security, there's two different programs. This is something that frankly I still have have to think about. The first program is Social Security. The second program is Supplemental Security Income or SSI. SSI is the program that is attached to Medicaid. So most people who are eligible for Medicaid are receiving SSI. Um, the exception is some individuals receive Social Security, for example, maybe due to um, um, a death of a parent or something like that, and then they are gonna qualify for Medicare. Why, and we can go to the next slide. This distinction is important because a lot of the, um, what we're proposing is around SSI. Um, so President Biden did propose in his budget, um, increasing SSI benefits to 100% of the federal poverty level, eliminating asset limits, eliminating marriage penalties, um, eliminating in-kind support and maintenance rules, um, eliminating waiting periods for social security and benefit the benefit cliff for social security and support the ABLE Age Adjustment Act. So this is what he proposed in during his campaign, to be clear. Um, this isn't what's necessarily going to be in the bill, but these are huge, these are all huge priority issues for the ARC and have been for decades, just like home and community-based services were created 40 years ago making them mandatory, which is the goal of, of, a bill, of the bill I'm about to talk about, has been a goal of the ARC for 40 years. Um, and so all of these things that President Biden um, is talking about is really exciting because these are things that the ARC has been talking about for the decades that these things haven't been fixed and adjusted. Um, we can go to the next slide. So, um, oh, I didn't realize <laughs> this was in here. That would have been valuable earlier. Um, so as this is just a little bit of a reminder about how budget reconciliation works and, but, but this is important in the social security context, because the reason that it, this is going, the, the fixes that are proposed that are going to be part of reconciliation, I'm willing, it, we're willing it to be so, will be for SSI because, um, social security is a part of the title two program. So this is all about, but really wonky budget rules. But that's just why it's not because we, we wouldn't want to fix both. The clarification is just because of the budget, really strict budget rules, we can only address SSI. But again, SSI is the one that's attached to Medicaid. So um, SSI is the one that would impact the majority of people with um, disability, with IDD. We can go to the next slide. So um, this is about a lot of the bills that are out there that um, Bethany Lilly from our team has been working on um, and a ton. So the, what is included is 
um, an increase in benefits and in eliminating asset limits and um, some marriage penalties. This was in um, a letter that went, and I believe it had over 100, uh, 150 members of Congress on it uh, and really pushed on getting the administration to look at including some SSI fixes in um, in whatever's coming together for the reconciliation package. So that letter really put, um, put a lot of pressure on the administration. And now, um, not only in the reconciliation proposals, but also in um, President Biden's budget, there were fixes to the asset and income limits included. Um, and so we'll be pushing to keep those included. We can go to the next slide. Um, these are the rest of uh, the rest of the things that Bethany is working on. But again, these are kind of more the long term. Uh, this because these are things that can't be done through uh, budget reconciliation. So we still need to work on increasing um, the substantial gainful activity uh, and also stopping the weight and continuing to monitor uh, the capacity of Social Security Administration overall. So just a few issues to work on um, in the Social Security space, but luckily they're being well covered by Bethany in our office. We can go to the next slide. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so I already talked about this, but this is how they're spelled out and these look a little bit different now because we just updated them yesterday with the introduction of the Better Care, Better Jobs Act. But our top priority remains that $400 billion investment. Um, and then a national paid leave program, as well as improvements to the Social Security Income Program. Um, and this explains it better than I, than I did, which is that um, it's still, since 1984, people with disabilities can't have more than $2,000 in savings. And that's what they're working on adjusting. Um, as well as, so the asset limits is really what we're trying to get included. And it seems very likely um, based on conversations that we're having that it is because it's really actually not that expensive of a fix, which is frustrating since it's something we've been pushing for forever, but that's the way the game is played. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, I'll Actually, I'll stop there. If anyone has any questions about social security, I will try to answer. <laughs> yes. Um what is the ARC doing and what can people do to increase the momentum for this social security restoration, um, which has stalled so often in the past? Yeah, I mean, I think that sometimes getting, it's not a little victory to get the asset limit, for example, in reconciliation, but build, that is building attention, right? Because we are going to be doing, we're doing story collecting, there's going to be um, I know some more opportunities for things like hill briefings, that sort of thing. Um, we also did include, um, and, and Sherry and Courtney are welcome to share the toolkit that I sent yesterday around because there are um, letters to the editor included um, on all of these issues and specifically we have some around social security and you can always, we want people to add to them and make them their own and you can also add things and you know, and once this is done, we need to get to the Social Security Restoration Act. Um, it's really just a, a matter of congressional will. Um, one positive thing is that our former staffer, TJ Sutcliffe, is a committee staffer uh, there. And so we know that there will be pushing pushing from the inside to keep it at the top priority. Um, but I think considering there hasn't been any fundamental changes in so long, getting a shift like SSI asset limits will be a good um, grease the wheels for, for more traction on, on the long-term changes that we've need, wanted to see, just as we're hoping that this $400 billion investment will get us closer to the ultimate goal of making HCBS a mandatory service. Thank you for that answer, Nicole. I did share a link in the chat to the ARC Michigan newsletter, which is a great place to keep updated with um, advocacy efforts. Yes, and you can always also go to the arc.org slash action and sign up for our action alerts. Claire, our director of advocacy would tell me to say that, so I'm saying it. Um, I say it every chance I get, yes. sign up. <laughs> yeah. I will say, and we really are good. We really don't send out too much stuff, only on the big important days like yesterday when that bill came out. Um, 
at least, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but I think we, we do a pretty good job of not bombarding people. Uh, and we also have a really cool story collection tool up there for both for HCBS, but also for social security. So, um, and an action alert around money follows the person. So lots of ways to engage. Um, so I talked about kind of how all these things piece together. Um, Long-term advocacy, that's where the Social Security Restoration Act would fall in, but it, it's also where, um, we can go to the next slide, um, the HCBS Access Act comes in. I couldn't help but um, use my favorite Schoolhouse Rock song um, cartoon in here. Uh, I <laughs> hum it more than I'd care to admit when, I'm, when I used to go to the Hill. Um, but the HCBS Access Act would address the fundamental issue, which is the institutional bias in the Medicaid program. It would make home and community-based services a mandatory service under the Medicaid program, um, which is, which would mean that there couldn't be waiting lists, but it also does a lot more than that. We can go to the next slide. Um, so it would make HCBS mandatory, um, so it, but it, and it also provides funding to build capacity and eliminate waiting lists. I know the question earlier was about the plan, but there's also a lot of funding. The HCBS Access Act includes 100% FMAP, so 100% federal dollars for 10 years to allow states to build the capacity that they need to, to serve individuals coming off of the waiting list, individuals aging into the system, et cetera. Um, it also creates a federal floor for services. So, I mean, there is a federal floor now, it creates a higher federal floor for services, I should say, um, which means that between eliminating the waiting list and also setting a, a higher floor for services, in, individuals and families would know that moving from state to state wouldn't put them at the back of a line and that they could rely on receiving the same service in state X as it is in, as they would in state Y. Um, and that's what we call dealing, addressing the Medicaid portability issue, which is something that we hear a lot about. Um, and ultimately it would fulfill one of the original purposes of the ARC when it was founded over 70 years ago, which is to ensure that people with disabilities can lives, uh, live their lives in the community, integrated into the community. Uh, this is, this bill, so I talked about March being a big month. March 11th, we got the $12.7 billion in the American Rescue Plan Act, along with all of a bunch of our other priority issues. March 16th, so five days later, this discussion draft came out. So it came out as a discussion draft so that um, Representative Dingle and Senators um, Brown, Hassan, and Casey could collect um, feedback specifically on the workforce piece. They wanna make sure that they're doing enough to address the workforce crisis um, within the bill. And we, we would have expected introduction sooner, but because of the Better Care, Better Jobs Act, we will turn back to this October 1st. I just said that to Representative Dingle's staff. I said, I won't bother you about that until October 1st, but then we will be right back at it. We can go to the next slide. So I, I just talked about the, um, the arc.org slash action. We have this, um, a lot of opportunities to share your story. And one thing that I always really wanna emphasize is that you don't have to be an expert on anything that I just talked about in order to be an effective advocate. Um, you just have to know how these services impact your own life, impact your family member's life, impact the people you serve life in order to be effective. I can tell you I've done probably thousands of Hill meetings at this point, and sure I can um, cite a statistic off the top of my head on probably most, most issues, but it's really when I talk about my own personal story, with my brother because just a couple weeks ago, I was on a phone call where we were talking about this bill and my brother's main DSP quit because she got a better paying job, right? That's the, the reality. And those are the, the that's the reality that legislators need to hear about. You don't need to feel, so don't be intimidated. Don't be worried about um, getting anything wrong because your only responsibility is sharing your own story. And you can also, you don't have to necessarily do it directly. You can go through the Arts um, Action Center and share your story over email. Um, but that's what's really important because that puts a face and a name and information to an issue. Um, and so when senators and representatives are voting on things like the Better Care, Better Jobs Act, they can be thinking when Senator Durbin or Senator Duckworth is making that vote, they can think about my brother who really needs those services um, instead of, a, they're not gonna be thinking about a number, they're just not. 
And it's also important to be educating people outside of just your legislators. I know in my own family, I'm from a really big family, and a lot of them didn't realize that Chris relies on Medicaid or what that means. And it's important that everybody knows so that when they hear about investments in these programs, they know that, that they're things that we should be supporting. And so I also encourage folks to talk to five people that you don't know about these services and why they matter over the summer. Uh, so that by the time we, we start sharing information in September, asking them to call their legislators, they're like, oh, I remember Nicole telling me about that at a barbecue. I'm really fun at parties, I'm sure. Um, but it just really is important to keep expanding um, outside of our silos. The ARC has been working really hard to not just work within the disability community, but also work with, with aging organizations and, and aging, uh, aging organizations, labor organizations, women's groups, um, to talk about how all of these issues tie together. And we're hoping that that really comes, um, bears fruit in September uh, as childcare and paid leave and home community-based services, what we're kind of packaging together as the care infrastructure is gonna end up with a vote. Hopefully all those connections will, will help. Um, but ultimately what it's about is making sure that legislators here why these services are so important. And again, the long history that the ARC and that the disability community has had for fighting them. And we really are on the precipice of taking some big chunks out of huge goals that we've had for a long time. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so, yep, so so uh, there's my email. So if you ever have, have a question, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm also happy to, to take some more questions now. Um, but uh, really glad to share information. And, and like I said, you guys got some, the most up-to-date information there is, so. Um, but I will stop now and take any additional questions. All right, I don't have any questions uh, typed in at this time, but I will share that um, if you haven't checked the chat window yet, I did share a link to the ARC Michigan newsletters, the ARC US, um, action alert and the opportunity uh the link if you want to take advantage of the opportunity um to tell your story about uh, the supports needed to live in your community this webinar um, is being recorded and the handouts if you miss them in the handouts window will be available or are available um, on the ARC Michigan website um, where you'll be able to find this recording. All right, I see no further questions at this time. Okay. Okay, thank you, Nicole. It's always a pleasure to listen to your updates at the ARC US national level. Um, I wanna thank everyone for attending our webinar series or webinar seminar today and for the attending the three previous Friday morning ones we have had. Um, I also want to thank everyone who's made governmental affairs and public policy donations. Every dollar counts and we've had a um, pretty successful June. Um, and so we really appreciate your support. That's how we are able to retain a lobbyist and work on the public policy issues that we do here at the state level and at the federal level. Um, anyway, everybody enjoy the rest of your Friday. We're giving you back a little gift of time of 32 minutes, I think. So that's always a good thing. And um, thanks again, Nicole. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye, Sherry. Bye, everyone. Bye.